What happens when we die? I guess a lot of people have asked themselves and wondered and thought about that question. Uh, what really happens when we die? What really happens when we take our last breath and we, and we leave this physical world? I want to read some scripture. It was pretty lengthy and I didn't want to divide it up and put it on the screen. So bear with me for just a second. This is really the, the, the text for the lesson tonight. It comes from Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> beginning with verse 19, it says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus uh, in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us, uh, you and I, there is a great chasm fixed uh, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cr cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said... They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said unto them, him, if, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Diversity is something that a lot of people use that word diversity to being able to do a lot of different things or be accomplished at at a lot of different things and it seems like it's a word that is used today it's sort of a buzzword it's sort of if you're a diverse individual you can do just about anything uh, long ago men from all over europe came to this country and you may think I'm getting off the beaten path here, but I'm, I'm going to get back on it real quick. So, But men came from Europe uh, to America. They took a land, and, and as they expanded across this great land, uh, America became known as the Great Melting Pot. Uh, people from many different places came together and they formed one culture. Uh, each group added something to the culture and basically blended in, uh, harmonized. Uh, many of those who now come don't want to blend in. Uh, many of the people that come to this country just want to uh, what we have and don't wish to be a part of us. They just want to have uh, the good life that we have and they don't really want to be a part of us. Some are afraid to mix uh, because lack of education or legal status. So we relax our standards in this country to uh, be able to allow other people to, to live here and to stay here uh, in that we accommodate uh, to others and not require them to accommodate to us. I think in one respect we allow immigrants from all over the world that can't even speak English. I think one priority is that they should be able to at least converse in English and have a good idea of, of how this country was formed and what, what goes on in this country. But as we're getting to the point here, we live side by side with people from all over the world and we don't become like they did in the beginning, that melting pot where we come together and have the same ideas and, and the same beliefs and the same practices. We can live side by side with someone from around the world and we never really know what their culture, culture is. Uh, 
diversity aside, there are many things that people have in common. Doesn't matter if they come from Europe or Africa or Australia or, or anywhere else. We do have something in common because we're human beings. Uh, in spite of the differences, our basic uh, physiology remains the same. We have basic needs. All human beings have the same needs. Uh, we need food, we need clothing, we need shelter, we need water to drink, we need air to breathe, don't we? We need oxygen. We all have the same needs. Uh, we all have the same psychological needs as well. Everyone wants to be liked. Everyone wants to be loved. Uh, everyone wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to fit in in one way or another. Everyone loves security in life. I mean, I don't know anybody that just won't, uh, likes to live by uh, the tip of the iceberg and never know what tomorrow is going to bring. Most people like security. They like to have a job. They like to have a home. They like to have uh, things that make their life better. Uh, from the beginning of time, man has uh, been more alike than not alike. Uh, but today we're, we're going apart from that because of how everything is set up. But one thing is for sure, what really links all of mankind, no matter where you're from, how long you've lived there, how long you've been here, there's one thing that we cannot deny. And that's death is going to come to everyone at some point in their life. We're not going to live forever. So what happens when we die? Death is going to come. Death is going to knock at our door at some time in our life. You can count on that. God says that. Uh, even all the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 recorded people that lived a long time. But you know what? There's none of those people that exist today. They're, they've all passed on. They've all died. Uh, Genesis 2 goes on and says the cause of death is sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 says, For as in Adam all die. Sin causes death. Uh, we can't get away from sin. Uh, as a Christian, we're forgiven. Uh, as a non-Christian, you're not forgiven. Sin causes death if you're not forgiven. Time has not changed the Word of God. Sin, sin still results in death. Uh, James 1 and 15 says, When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Uh, when it's not forgiven, it brings forth death. The basic premise is that all sin and all will die. Uh, that's the law of sin and death. Now, God has put into place a remedy for that law. That is, if we would accept on His terms, uh, obey the gospel and accept Christ, and we could be forgiven for our sin, and we could avoid that penalty for the law of sin and death. Romans 5 and verse 12 says, Therefore, just as though one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. We don't are not under the law of sin and death just because uh, Adam sinned. It's because we all sin. And the only way we can avoid that is have forgiveness of our sins. Even though all people die, we don't like talking about it, do we? We don't like to talk about death. People say, oh, that's a morbid topic. I don't even want to think about it. Don't want to talk about it. Uh, I was looking online the other day, and a way that you can tell what people don't want to think about death is by how many people in different cultures fix up wills. You know, a will is fixed up because someone's mind is, is set on the idea that, hey, we're not going to live forever. One of these days, guess what? We're going to die, so I want to be prepared. I want my family to be taken care of. I want uh, everything in writing for what's going to be done. But I was looking online. 26% of adult Hispanic Americans have a will. 26%. So the other three quarters of Hispanics, adults, don't even like to think about death. They don't want nothing to do with it. Now, 32% of African Americans have a will in the United States. Then you go to white Americans, 52%. So as a whole, we think a little bit more about death than anyone else in this country. 
that says a lot for who we are. We think about death. We know that death is going to come at some particular time. I think people fear death because it's unknown. Why? Well, I don't know anyone that has died and, 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 and gone into the afterlife and come back and has told me all about what happened. Uh, and I don't think anyone else has either. So it's an unknown thing, and it causes a lot of fear. And people fear the un unknown. People don't know anyone who have experienced and can tell us what's on the other side of this physical life. You, there's just not anyone to, you hear stories about people that have been brought back on the operating table and, and things like that but you know when people die people don't come back and say well I, I went to heaven and sat next to God or I went to uh, here and, and, and to wait on God uh, on the other hand Christians have a savior who has experienced death uh, our best measure in life is to follow Christ is it not we call ourselves Christians so Christ experienced death and the Bible which was written by the only uh, one who can overrule death God uh, our attitude should be different from those who don't have a Savior who don't believe in God uh, of all people the Christian should have a little better understanding about death first of all life who gave life God God is the author of life. It's a gift from God. Life is arbitrarily and undeservably given. I didn't do anything for God to give me life. Not one single thing. In fact, I didn't choose to be born. Neither did you. Your parents may have chose the time that you were going to be born, but I didn't choose life. I certainly didn't know when I was going to be born. Uh, I didn't do anything good to be born. I didn't do anything bad to be born. Uh, the choice to give life, it, it wasn't mine. It was God's. God gives life. So God is the source of all life. Now, as much as man has tried, man cannot create life. You know, there was a joke that where people have tried and you know the, the punchline was you got to get your own dirt you know because god formed man out of the dirt of the earth uh but man uh, man has tried to create life forms and, and it's not been successful uh when god created adam it says he created him in his image he gave of himself john 5 26 says for just as the father has life in himself even so he gave to the son to have life in himself uh, it is god who gives each man life and, and gives each man a, a spirit uh, Zechariah 12 and 1 says thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within it so God gives us life he gives us the spirit he gives us our soul so when a man's life leaves him uh, where does his spirit go where does his soul go who who owns life and who owns the soul when we die this physical life where does our spirit go well the bible says it goes back to god who gave it uh, god has control of it in other words uh, so we must understand ecclesiastes 12 17 says then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to god who gave it so god created it it god owns life it belongs to him it will return to him if we understand it a little better our life is just on loan from god for a little while it really is we don't possess it we don't control it you know i can't stand here and control anything in my life i mean health wise uh things of that nature uh I can't do it. God can control those things. God alone decides when to give and when to retrieve uh, his souls from mankind. Ecclesiastes 8 and 8 says, No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. So none of us, uh, when it's our time, none of us can, can ward off that, that debt. You know, uh, people say, well, I, I'm, it's like a cat with nine lives. You know, I, I cheated death this time. But you know, it really wasn't your time. When it's really your time, uh, your time is going to be up. Uh, when God wants your soul and, and decides it's your time, it's going to be up. Uh, 
God refused to allow Satan to take the life of Job because uh, uh, life is, is very precious to him and he didn't want uh, Satan to take the life of Job. Uh, God even added 15 years to the life of, of King Hezekiah uh, because of prayer. Uh, God took the lives of Ananias and Sophia because of, of evil things and an evil deed. So only God uh, can, can take life and all life is God's. He may do with life as he pleases. He can reward people, extend their lives or he can uh, require their soul. Uh, it's, it, it belongs to him. Uh, but we have to accept the fact that death is not the end of us. It may be the end of this physical being, but it's not the end of us. Remember, God also created us with a spirit, with a soul. That soul lives on. So death is not the end for us. Uh, it's just the beginning. You know, when you, we were talking about English before class. Whew. English was my toughest subject in high school. I couldn't stand it. You know, I, I, I had to work really hard to just to get by. Uh, all the punctuations and the commas and the verbs and the pronouns and all, everything that you had to learn. But, you know, life ends with a comma it doesn't end with a period you know when, when life death comes it's not a period there's a comma there because it goes on doesn't go on here in this physical world but it goes on in the spiritual hereafter uh, once a person is born he never ceases to exist that spirit will live somewhere even when you leave this physical world you never cease to exist uh, what we know as death is but a temporary condition. Uh, we're here for a little while. Physically, we die, but our soul does not die. It lives on. Uh, man is body and, and soul. Uh, death is the separation of, of one part of, of man from the other. All we're doing is, and all God is doing is when we die, is that he's separating that soul from that earthly body. Now that earthly body is going to return to dust, as he said. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. You know, that body is going to return, but that spirit is going to uh, be God's. Now, depending on oh, how you've lived your life and what you've done, it depends on what God is going to do and where He's going to place that soul for all eternity. Uh, death is a separation uh, of part of man from the other. The word death actually means separation. So God is separating the physical body from the uh, eternal soul. Uh, James 2 and 26 says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Uh, he explains death a little bit there. And uh, Genesis 25 and verse, or 35 and 18 says, It came about as her soul was departing, for she died. Uh, our soul leaves our physical body when we take our last breath. Uh, when the eternal spirit is separated, it does not cease to exist. It's just a separation from the physical uh, to the spiritual. Now, Jesus told the thief on the cross, if you remember, uh, today you shall be with me in paradise. Many people take that scripture way out of context and they say that baptism is not necessary because Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, which they equate as heaven, as heaven. Uh, not so. Uh, it's a total misunderstanding. Uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then we'll get on to that. Even though the bodies went to the grave that day, Jesus said today to one of those thieves, you will be with me in paradise. Okay. Uh, when a person dies, his soul returns to God. And there are many claims about uh, the souls of those who've died. You know, people see bright lights and they see all sorts of things. But, you know, nobody can go and, and has walked with God and talked with God. And it's not been explained to them so they can come back and tell us. Some people believe that the soul sleeps when you die uh, or lingers near the body for a few days. Uh, and I'm getting this as a census of what generally people believe 
off the, off the internet. Some say it uh, will stay and haunt the living if they have unresolved issues. I mean, you get a gamut of what people believe about the soul of mankind. Uh, I don't believe the souls wait on a light to appear and then walk into it. Uh, if you remember the scripture we read a while ago, uh, and let me get it up here. It says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. He didn't walk into a bright light. It says the angels came and carried him into Abraham's bosom. Now think about it. It says the rich man also died and was buried. Now, no soul will voluntarily, just like an individual, no person will voluntarily go into a place of torment. Now, demons had to be cast out and they did not leave without a struggle in many cases when demons were cast out of people. Uh, Matthew 8 and 31 says they negotiated to be put into swine, not left bodiless. Uh, so they didn't walk into a lot. They didn't, they didn't want to go voluntarily. Uh, but here we see that the angels carried uh, the beggar uh, to Abraham's bosom. Uh, when God takes a soul, he simply takes what belongs to him. Now, he can have it brought to him or he can discard it. It depends on how you've lived your life, how, whether or not you've been obedient, whether or not you're Christian, uh, whether or not you're faithful at the time of your death. But Satan tries to uh, convince mankind that God will never discard you for any reason. That God's just too good of a God uh, to discard you. Uh, but Satan tries to convince you that. Uh, remember the garden, Satan convinced Eve that she would not die uh, if she ate of that tree. Uh, at the moment of death, though, <clears throat> the soul and the body are, are, are separated. And at that time, the soul returns to God to be the judge. And I, that's not the judgment, don't get me wrong. But God knows whether or not you're a Christian or whether or not you're a non-Christian. Now, at that point, we're all to, at one time supposed to stand before judgment in front of God. But when we die, the, the great judgment has not taken place. So where do we go? What happens when we die? Well, just like everyone, they have a different opinion and a different idea about where people go, whether they sleep, whether they wait, uh, whatever happens. Um, but verse 22 and 23, uh, if I can get that to change, of, of Luke 16 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, I want you to make a note that where it says in verse 23, And in hell, in some translations, it says Hades. But... Uh, many times they transpose hell and Hades as the same word. It's not the same word. Uh, hell is talked about uh, as being an eternal dwelling place for those that are judged. Uh, and there's a place that's been fixed uh, for Satan and his followers and all the ungodly. Now, Hades, on the other hand, uh, is a place that is known as a place of all receiving. So if you talk about Lazarus and the rich man, you know, they both died. They both went to Hades. Jesus even said that Hades could not keep his body. Three days he came back. He didn't go to hell. He went to Hades. Now, we'll get to it. There's a couple of parts in Hades, and then I'll explain that as we go along. Uh, if we look at verse 27 and 28, 
It says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So it's pretty evident that the rich man wasn't in the good part of Hades. He was in the bad part of Hades. There's a division line here, and it says that no one can cross that point. Uh, every knee will bow uh, before Christ. We know that. The Scripture says that. Uh, the separation is permanent. It's, it's unalterable. If we go on and look at verse 26, uh, it says, And besides all this, there is a great gulf fixed so that which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So if you're on the good side and you, someone else is on the bad side, there's no going back and forth. Uh, and then the part about the story of the rich man and Lazarus is that we're not told that Lazarus ever saw the rich man. Uh, he was in the comfort and the bosom of Abraham, but the rich man could look over and see uh, Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. There's two places for souls before the great resurrection and the great judgment in front of God. All go to Hades. It's a place of all receiving. Uh, Christ said that it could not contain his body. He certainly didn't go to hell. He went to Hades. Uh, the wicked go to a, a place of torment. Uh, in verse 23, it tells us that. It says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He, could, he was in torment. He felt that torment. He wanted Lazarus to come and drop a drop of water on his tongue. And he said, in these flames. So he was definitely in torment. He felt great pain. He felt anguish. Uh, he was aware that La Lazarus was not in torment. He was aware because he could see him in the bosom of Abraham. Um, the rich man didn't claim to be innocent and say, hey, give me another chance. You know, I, I didn't know. I, I, he knew why he was there. He just wanted somebody to go back and warn his brother. But there's not a second chance. You know, there's many people today that teach that, hey, you're going to get a second chance. Uh, God doesn't offer second chances. He offers us plenty of chances in this lifetime. We have to get it right in this uh, lifetime. Uh, the rich man never claimed he was undeserving. He never claimed to be innocent. Uh, he, he knew where he was at and knew why he was there. He just wanted someone to go and warn his brother. Now, this place of torment, uh, the, the good part of Hades is known as paradise. Now, that will bring back what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say heaven. He said in paradise. So if paradise is the good part of Hades, when Jesus died, he went to Hades. When the thief on the cross died, he went to Hades. On the paradise side, not on the torment side. So Jesus told him the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You'll be with me in Hades, but on the paradise side. Uh, the part where the rich man was has been translated from the word Gehenna uh, or in some translations to Taurus, uh, depending on, on the word that's used. Uh, of Gehenna, Strong says that this was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned, and it's sort of a fit symbol of the wicked and, and their future destruction. To the Jews, this dump site was horrid. That It was unclean. They wouldn't be anywhere around it. They wouldn't be anywhere close to it. It was the most vile place to them on the face of the earth. Uh, a practicing Jew wouldn't even go near this place called Guiana. Uh, this communicated a discard of, uh, of defiled, worthless, and unholy uh, animals and things of that nature. There was always fire smoldering and dead animals burning and rotting. Uh, it was a place that was just a horrible place to be around. So the Totora side, the bad pop side of Hades, 
comes from this root word because it was a terrible place. There's flames there. It's, people are in anguish. Uh, it's not a good place. But like Lazarus, the Christian goes to the paradise side. Uh, our text does not say whether Lazarus could see the rich man. It just says that he was in the bosom uh, of Abraham. The point is... These two parts to Hades, uh, Paradise or to Taurus and Guiana, uh, make up uh, the good side and the bad side of Hades. When Jesus returns, he will bring with him the souls that are in paradise. Remember when the scripture says when the Lord returns, he'll not set foot on the earth, but the dead in Christ shall rise first. They'll rise from the paradise side of Hades. Why? Because we all have to stand before God in judgment. But God knows our heart. When we leave this world, He's not going to put us in a place of torment if we leave a faithful Christian. We're there and reserved to the day the Lord will come and we'll stand in judgment. Uh, Johnson says those who are faithful at death sleep in the bosom of God. Uh, now we know that's not the word of God it's a commentary but uh, many people explain since Lazarus didn't uh, actually speak or, or acknowledge the rich man that he may have been sleeping in the bosom of Abraham uh, I can't say either way because we're not told uh, but uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to to be in the paradise side of Hades and be protected and asleep in the bosom of Abraham Oh uh, yeah, and waiting on God to return, uh, Christ to return to usher us in that judgment and into heaven forever. Certainly it would. Uh, it says those who are uh, reserved will return to heaven in their new resurrected body is alive and whole. And the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17 says, so we shall always be with the Lord. Our soul will never die. Uh, and it doesn't cease to be and exist uh, when we leave this world. It should give us great comfort as a Christian. Uh, there's neither uh, comfort or consolation outside of Christ. There can be none. Think about that horrible side of Hades. Think about uh, after the judgment, uh, hell and the torment and the anguish that's there. There's no comfort that can ever be consoled in a person's heart that's not a Christian. There's no comfort to be had. You know, when Jews re uh, Jesus returns, every knee will bow before him, and they will. Everyone will know that Christ has returned. Remember, Judgment Day is going to be a day of sentencing. It's going to be a day when we all stand in front of God and we're judged. Uh, it, John 20, 5 and 29 says, All will live again, but not all will live a God, with, with God. Uh, certainly, if you have any hope at all as a Christian, your hope is that you live with God. You don't want to live apart from God because if you live apart from God, it's going to be uh, a terrible existence and it'll never end. Uh, this life was sort of a, a trial for us. You know, if, you, if you're any familiar at all with the legal system, uh, there has to be a trial to find out if someone's guilty or innocent or what they've done. And when the, when the verdict comes in, uh, there's a judgment. Uh, for the guilty, that judgment is... is